Hello and welcome to the Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical every single day. On today's podcast, I chat to Scottish illustrator Nicole McLaughlin, aka Nico Paws, about a Keith Haring work which, since coming across it at Tate Liverpool's 2019 retrospective, has had a massive impact on her. The work is called Silence Equals Death. Now, if you're anything like me, you will know Keith Haring as this superstar street artist whose work took New York by storm in the 1980s. His artistic language is one that is universal and I'm fairly certain almost everyone listening will have at some point seen his crawling baby figure or his barking dog characters or dancing figures that sort of intertwine and weave in and out of each other, which has been produced millions of times over on badges, t-shirts, prints, you name it. You'll have probably seen it, and you, but you just probably don't know him by name. But what this chat will prove to you is that there is so much more to Haring than his cartoon figures. He was an artist way ahead of his time who used the power of art to create this universal language for the masses, as well as raise awareness of America's crippling AIDS epidemic throughout the 1980s. Just a little word of warning before we begin. Some listeners may find what we discuss a little upsetting, but this work has a very powerful message behind it and I hope you learn a little something which you did not know before. Another thing just to point out, this podcast was recorded during lockdown and um, because of that the audio in times isn't as fantastic or to the standard that you might expect or to which I personally hope it will be. Um, this is a learning curve and we're just we're just going with it, but it doesn't take away from um, the message and the importance of this work. So do sit back and relax and I hope you enjoy this first episode of the Joe's Art History Podcast. Hi Nicole, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. Not a problem. Uh, right, so Nicole, today you and I are going to talk about, um, actually, is this one of the first exhibitions you and I ever went to together to see? I think we went, we've probably gone to a couple in like Kelvin Grove and stuff like that, um, but this is like the first con- complete artist-based exhibit that we've been to. Yeah, that's, yeah, because I can't really remember going to anything I mean, maybe when we were little and stuff, going to Kelvin Grove in Glasgow. But anyway, so today we're going to be talking about um, one artwork in particular from this exhibition, which I think um, left both of us a little bit lost for for words at the end of it. And particularly you, you got very, very emotional near the end of it. And um, we're, of course, talking about... Keith Haring's exhibition at Tate Liverpool but the work that we're going to be talking about in length is um, a work called Silence Equals Death. Well just first and foremost like what do you what do you know about Keith Haring because I know Nicole that you, you're obviously an illustrator and you um, you, you have a, a sort of a broad sense of artists and people who inspire you. Is Keith is Keith work somebody that you that you find instantly recognizable and uplifting his work instantly recognizable I think people probably wouldn't know his name but they know his style just really famous for his public work and his graffiti stuff so he was someone that I knew of um but going to the exhibit definitely created a new appreciation for him considering a lot of the public work that he's done and how he used activism a lot in his work, um, just kind of really emphasised the power that art has um, within the general public. Yeah, totally. I mean, because I, obviously, I studied art history at university and we didn't really touch on Haring. I mean, like you said, I think his images are so recognisable. You, you'll know them visually, but perhaps you, mm-hmm. don't, perhaps you don't know them by name. And I think that in itself just shows how much of an impact he has as an artist and even 
even when I was studying art history and I think when we first came over when we first sort of went over it but very very briefly like I said I remember being like oh my gosh is that who this guy is because yeah. like it's just they're just there and they're they're it's it, they're everywhere and they're used on all sorts of like t-shirts and key rings and mugs and street art and he's um I don't know but for me I think I didn't really realize how much of an activist he was and how important his work is and sort of how how he sort of came up through the ranks because yeah, there's one thing I was reading. Um, in like 1986, he made a pop-up shop, yeah. and he decorated the entire interior of it. Um, and he made like everything. He just wanted everything to be affordable and accessible because he wanted to break the barrier within the art world. Mm-hmm. So it was no longer at least it's kind of what you're doing, Joe. Um, well, in, a, in art, a very sort of smaller scale. I mean, and also scale, yeah, <laughs> had, the, had the audience. <laughs> We're on <laughs> one day, perhaps, but no, exactly. But like he, the art world hated him for it because yeah. he wanted to bridge the gap and make it accessible, and that's why a lot of his work was, you know, murals and graffiti, and done like I think it was like a uh, hundred paintings in the subway, mm. just white, white, no, black paint with just black paint. He just yeah. wanted everyone to be able to see his art. And the fact that there was a lot of social messages in it is yeah. just another thing that's just like, good boy, good boy. Yeah, absolutely. And like, so going back to the shop, that was um, for him, his kind of like middle finger up to the art world because it was the first time really an artist had sold prints and T-shirts and mugs and pins of his work because mm. everyone could enjoy it and he did love working with the public like you said like he so he started out making um, murals on the subway in New York and what he used to use is when um, when there was a space for, a, for a, an advertisement in the subway what they used to do is just put black like black paint over the old advertisement until another company paid some money to put a poster there so what Keith mm-hmm. did go around and particularly during the height of Russia, right, and just use some chalk on the black paint and just draw something. And he actually created quite a lot of stir. And there's a fantastic quote that's on the Tate website, which of course now I've lost. <laughs> I wrote everything down. Because oh, I knew it. I'd lose my legs. Oh, I've got like five pages, man. I feel so proud of myself. Honestly, though, the painting still hits me to this day. And it was... I'd never actually gone back and researched him as a person. So yeah. reading his stuff, it's just, I think it's such an interesting thing to see someone so young. It wasn't even as if he had like a bad background. You know, he's, his dad was like one of his inspirations, mm. but he just knew what he could do and how he could help and change the world. Like he would work with a lot of hospitals, orphanages, charities to kind of put them out in the forefront like it was never ever for himself it was yeah. always to help other people which yeah. is what I believe is what art should be I don't think it should be this really selfish thing and you know we like for me personally I have an ability to use my art to portray a message mm-hmm. so that message should be used for good rather than for money no totally Although, and it's yeah no continue well, right now I just draw cats, so do you know what I mean? It's not as I'm changing the, changing the world one cat at a time. But well, when you, you, I can do serious stuff, um, and when yeah. I do do serious stuff, there is always a message behind it. Yeah, of course. But also, you love what you do, Nicole, and there's no elitism or clout. And what you're doing is everybody, it's accessible to everybody who wants to access it. And that's exactly mm. what sort of the ethos with Keith. Um, Keith's pieces were and they always contained a message so I found this quote that I was going on about a wee minute ago so going back very briefly to the subway so he said all kinds of people would stop and look at the huge drawing and many were eager to comment on their feelings towards it this was the first time I realized how many people could enjoy art if they were given the chance these were not the people I saw in the museums or in the galleries but a cross-section of humanity that cut across all boundaries yeah it's pretty true. much it's true and I think that's why I think graffiti is a, a really important thing and he really was one of the first 
iconic graffiti artists mm-hmm. and of course like as his popularity grew and like you said he used his you know he, he worked a lot with communities and children and things like that but he also had he, he, he was very very well connected and he was picked up very quickly by the gallery scene so because he was selling so well he was able to but he like he was able to do these projects but again on the other hand he could have just kept all that money and done you know what he wanted with it and made it for himself and exactly. used it to become bigger and bigger no, yeah, totally. He's, de- he's definitely like a campaignist for like art for all, art for the greater good, and mm-hmm. that's something that I didn't really know about him until I went to this exhibition. Yeah, but even because the things that I'd normally seen about him were like the crawling baby one. I love that. I don't know the official names, but mm. if you were to look it up, you would know what it is. Yeah, a lot no. of the kind of primary colors with the white figures, and they're all kind of dancing. Yeah. The barking dogs, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd only really seen this stuff. I'd never really seen his activism stuff, but obviously mm-hmm. there was probably messages within those ones. But it was as we walked around the exhibit and it it was like a transition of his life. So it started off with the early stuff, so like the cartoons and then like comics and stuff like that. Then into when he was in, um, when he went to the School of Visual Arts in New York where he was like really inspired by the club scene and the queer community and then his stuff became more expressive where he would do things like um, installations and like collaborating with other artists video Mm. art and stuff yeah and it ended with the piece that we're going to talk about and Mm -hmm. it to me was just the perfect way to end it because he like I don't even know how I'm trying to say this but it's it's just weird how the stuff that I knew him for wasn't the stuff that really hit me and affected me. Yeah. Does, does that, if that makes sense. No, totally, totally. Mm. And I think it's, I don't know, it was a real, it really was a fantastic exhibition and a total eye opener. Mm-hmm. And it sort of took you sort of chronologically through his life and where he where he came from so sort of starting with the subway drawings and then moving to studios and um he was so he did a lot of collaborations with people like um Jean-Michel Basquiat and Andy Warhol um Grace Jones was another influence and sort of um friend of his and he painted her very famously for one of her music videos um, so he did have a huge, a huge pool of people. And he even worked, I was reading earlier that he worked with a group of school children to create a mural with them to celebrate the 100th year since the installation of the Statue of Liberty in New York. So that yeah. he was like right pinnacle peak of all these crazy artists because Andy Warhol was so, so famous in his lifetime. And then to work with school kids, like it doesn't, you know there was no sort of elitism in how he acted yeah um, and I think that takes us quite nicely onto the piece that we're going to sort of talk about in, in a round so silence mm-hmm. equals death so Nicole do you want to describe what this looks like I will describe it if you want I can even give a little bit of um history behind why it was created mm-hmm. no, no uh, so just just for people at home just like Oh. If you want to just describe what it looks so, like. So it is, and I even got the measurements, it's 101.6 centimetres by 101.6 centimetres. So it's this massive square. It's acrylic on canvas. So mm-hmm. it's a black background with a pink triangle that pretty much fills the canvas mm-hmm. and overlapping it is white figures. Um. So... This piece was inspired because in 1988, Haring was diagnosed with AIDS. Mm-hmm. Um, and within that, that was when the AIDS pan- is it epidemic? Um, yeah, AIDS epidemic. So that's when it was kind of in full swing. So majority of people that were affected by AIDS within that time period were people in the queer community. Um, so the government at the time just did nothing about it and they pretty much it was just completely based on homophobia and prejudice and a lot 
it was just major ignorance um, because they just didn't want to deal with it. And a lot of people saw it as like, you know, God curing gayness, which is disgusting. Mm-hmm. Um, so art was used as a major way to highlight what was happening within the queer community. Yeah. Um, and the just the mistreatment of queer folk who were suffering from this disease. So Silence Equals Death was made in 1989. Um, so this is the first time I think I've re-looked at it again. Um, and I didn't realise that the figures were hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Yeah, I was exactly the same. I, I, I just saw figures and... I read this thing that was like, it's very obviously this. And I'm like, it's, it's really not very obviously that. No, you really, really need to, to look at that. And I think if, if no one pointed that out to me. I would have I missed mean, it. Yeah, totally. But like, it's, but when you see it, like they just it just kind of looks like a very sort of chaotic crowd. And you don't know what people are doing because basically they're, they're, they're all overlapped on each other. Yeah. Well. So there, there really is no break. Yeah. Um, and the figures, it's like a mass wave of people, almost like a protest. Where, well, I thought it one originally. I just thought it was a cluster of people suffering. Mm. Um, because I really, I think maybe it's kind of best to explain the context of where it was. We have explained it was at the end of the exhibit, but just before it, there was a video showing protests outside the White House, mm-hmm. and yeah. it was oh my god! And that's, I think it was that triggered it and then I turned around and saw this piece and it just hit home like what was what happened within this like within that time period of the AIDS epidemic yeah so, so it was this, people so this is what you're referring to this is the ashes action in 1992 mm-hmm. this is what you're referring to so what yeah. what was the ashes action Nicole what happened um so this what was it people were outside the White House protesting and crying and they had names of people that passed um it was just people like holding sigils I think it was just heartbreaking because I don't as someone who is bisexual I am very privileged that I've been surrounded by love and acceptance and I'm within a time period where it is a bit more acceptable Mm -hmm. so to actually see where it once was was Mm -hmm. It's just so hard hitting to realise that we still have a long way to go. Yeah, no, absolutely. But, but I think, yeah, I think it was just turning around. But for me, what I noticed was the big pink triangle, um, which I have always known was what was used to showcase um, people who were gay in concentration camps. Yeah, but is, yeah. What I didn't know was that it was upside down, which represented that they were considered the bottom of society. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've always, I, anytime I've seen a pink triangle, um, I knew it was to do with Nazi um, Germany. So I think turning around and seeing the pink triangle and then it kind of just all correlated and then I was just like, whoa. So just to give you, to people at home, just a little bit more context about the... Um silence equals death it was created by hiring for um this aids activist group called act up and Mm -hmm. it was used as their sort of logo um for peace and justice and just really to be recognized that what's going on is wasn't acceptable and this was under um it was under two presidencies actually so it was during the 80s sort of 1983 1984 that the aids epidemic really kicked off in New York and by the end of the 80s 89,343 deaths had happened due to AIDS and President Reagan at the time did nothing they did nothing they didn't yeah try and address it or um, try and advertise to promote sort of safer ways of having sex there was medical research going on, but it, it wasn't considered an emergency. Yeah. And the the community took it as, as you said, like a sort of culling of the queer community and like that the president was acting like like God and also that 
much like the Nazis, it was a genocide of a certain type of people that yep. under this rule was not welcome in society. Yeah. Which is so upsetting. And the so what the march did was it was 18 members of ACT UP had passed from AIDS, had been as they as they called it, had been murdered by AIDS and from the lack of support and treatment that their government had on offer to them. Yeah. So what this group did was they marched, this was in 1992, they marched to the White House uh, holding the arms of, that contained the that, ashes of these eight. That's right. Groups. I'm now remembering because they scattered the ashes on the field, didn't they? Exactly. So they walked yeah. up to the gates of the White House and scattered the ashes on the lawn of the White House through the fence. And it's it's incredibly the video you can be found can be found on the internet and I'll, I'll include a link to it in the show notes. It's a really tough fifteen minute watch because it's yeah. people just so desperate for yeah and mourning the loss of well that's it. so many angry. innocent victims yeah not a hundred percent and Haring actually passed away from AIDS in February 1990. At the age so of 31. He didn't live to see this march happen. And it wasn't until, at this time, um, when you were diagnosed with AIDS, it was still a death sentence. It wasn't until 1997 where Dr. Ho invented, mm. not, not a cure, but something that could sustain the treatment of the disease. And yeah. Uh, it meant that it was no longer a death sentence. You, you could live quite quite a normal life and a, 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 a long life instead of it being a, a death sentence like it was. But until this was discovered in 1997, there was 300,000 deaths from AIDS within 15 years, 16 years. Yeah, which that's is mental. Crazy. It's crazy. And for one artwork to to contain this amount of history is just is just amazing and so tragic but also how powerful the message of art has and what this yeah means. I think you've just nailed it dirty just the power of art and just how simple shapes and line and form color choice can just hit a message home um, and, that's it. and and they do this wonderful thing with it so like you like you said earlier that um it was it was a symbol used by nazis in the concentration camp and the the triangle was inverted but what act up did and what Haring did was um flip, flip it back up flip it back up and reclaim it and i think the queer community has been fantastic at, at doing that reclaiming even the word queer um yeah they've been so brilliant at reclaiming what was used against them that were derogatory exactly and used to marginalize them it's it's a really it was a really powerful end to an exhibition and it, i know that, that you said that you you got very upset did, did it make you want to go away and sort of learn more were you did you feel like ashamed that you didn't know any of this because i know i felt guilt that i was as an art historian so oblivious to how important this one piece of work was yeah I think it's you know right now within current affairs it very much marked my privilege and what I was saying when, earlier on how you know I've been very fortunate you know I'm in a very loving like I'm surrounded by people who love me who accept me whereas this was a time where and it you know it does still happen but it's not happened to me so it was very much out of sight out of mind so it did make me really want to go and research it. And, you know, I don't think you can ever stop researching and ever stop learning. Oh, no, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it highlighted such a hard hit an issue that we obviously, because we weren't around for the AIDS pandemic. Um, epidemic. Epidemic, sorry, pandemic on the mind. Oh, well, um, absolutely. <laughs> when I was writing in my notes, I wrote pandemic and I was like, oh, e. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, no, I think, yeah, for sure. Just 
really clocked my privilege, um, which is something that, you know, the, the good thing about this pandemic is getting the time to kind of research and actually learn about the world. Because I do think the world does go very quickly, but you have to kind of stop, take a second and think of people who are less fortunate than you and really put yourself in their shoes. And the best way we can do that is with knowledge. Well, absolutely. And I think arts are really powerful too um mm. to, to do that with yeah. um, and it's something that keith haring continues to do to this day um before so he was as you said before he was diagnosed in 1988 with his with aids and sadly passed away in 1990 but in 1989 he set up the keith haring foundation do you know yes. do you know anything about that or i'd heard about it um, so this was his foundation to, I guess, raise awareness and raise funds for people with AIDS. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, it's just one of the things that it does. So it's, it's a foundation which um, it works with communities and school children and groups to sort of, um, just as like what you said, raise awareness of AIDS and gay rights activism and why it's important. And it's also in charge of his estate, his artist's estate. Um, but a great, a great thing to, a great legacy to, to leave behind, really. Yeah. And an artwork that is so, I don't know, like, I think when you think about Haring, he's, he's known, like you said, for his, like, his bold colours and figures, but this is it's quite there's something dark and yet hopeful within it I yeah don't, I don't know I don't know what, how you feel when when you look at it what does, does it speak well to I you think it spoke to me about different when about the hear no evil see no evil um mm. because that was obviously to represent the Reagan administration completely ignoring the issue um and the lack of funding for science and stuff like that yeah. Um, but I think when I was reading that, and you're just like, oh my god, even the, like you just kind of forget the many layers of ignorance and how higher, like they had the power and the ability to, you know, kind of cap it and help people, but they just chose not to because they just people saw it as an opportunity to promote, you know, anti queer agenda and you're just like my god imagine looking at something like that people dying is a good thing mm. or, no not even as a, as a good thing just people I know, I know I know a lot of people did look at it like that but even just to turn a blind eye to yeah, a community that a we're community in desperate with... needs yeah exactly exactly yeah I think it just it kind of hit the same and like my voice is shook a wee bit as I keep talking about it because I'm just like oh yeah because it is, it's just such a, God, it's just crazy, like, the pri- like I guess, privilege and ignorance and how hand-in-hand hand they go together and how nothing gets resolved because of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's my, my opinion on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Nicole, for... Um, sharing your thoughts and your knowledge on this really incredible piece and I hope everyone listening has learned a little something and will of course leave a link to that um the 1992 act up march for you to watch if you're interested at all but like we said a bit of a warning it's it's a very tough 15 minutes to watch particularly near the end um just the the sheer grief of people but there is also a, a power in it and a power within um, this this work. And yeah. also that just people need to, we need to help each other and be yeah. nicer, really. But I want to end on a nice, a nicer note um, than sort of the the doom and gloom surrounding the, um, the ACT UP marches and, and activism, which of course were incredibly important. Um, Nicole, my how I would like to end the podcast is it's a bit of a tricky question. Um, all right. I want to ask all my guests this. <laughs> um so 
You can take this question out as large or as small as you want it to be. But my question is, why is art important? Oh. <laughs> um, I could really only say for me personally, <laughs> which I'll assume people will agree. It's a language that doesn't need words that anyone can understand. It opens up a community. And it's a way to, for me personally, it's a way I can express myself and have fun. It's a distraction. A lot of things wouldn't exist without art, which is what boggles my mind. Like you need an architect to design your buildings, a product mm -hmm. designer to design your chairs. Everything that you use and need requires a designer, which is art. So the world wouldn't be the world that it is without it. It really does frustrate me that people do look down on art so much. Like, it's a joke. Um, but no, I think it is one of the most important things. It can, you know, for example, the piece we just spoke about, it can hit, like, look at Haring's, like, spectrum of work. He could make fun stuff and he could make hard-hitting stuff. Mm -hmm. There's just no end or no, poss no possible. There's no lack of possibility for what you can do with art. And yeah. I think it's such an amazing thing to show children that there are no restrictions and you could literally do anything. And although sometimes I do find it frustrating, you know, if someone puts like a nail on a wall and that's their exhibit, but you know what, that was their choice. That's their meaning. That's how they chose to express themselves. And that's fun. Thank you very much. That's a very tough question to answer. I know that's a bit of a mean one, uh, just to sort of throw at you and not... Um, not uh... Give me two hours to research. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's <laughs> quite like a, an off the cuff comment, but I thought you answered that beautifully. Um, oh. And before you go, is there anywhere, where can people find you and what you do and what you're up to? So, as Joe said, I am an illustrator. I currently prioritize on cutesy, fun, quirky visuals. You can find me on Instagram at nicopause underscore. Um, my website is nicomclaughlin.com for my mm -hmm. more kind of professional editorial stuff. Um, but yeah, come give us a little follow. Um, I post fun stuff. I spam people with pictures of my cats. Um, but yeah, that's where I am. That's great. Well, and we'll leave links to all of that in the show notes. Uh, lastly, Nicole, thank you so so much for being my first guest on the Joe's Art History podcast and I hope you've learned a little something I know I definitely have as well thank you so much no thank you for having me and I've learned way more than I knew and I'm gonna keep learning because that's what life's about amazing right thank you so much thank you bye and there you have it the end of the Joe's Art History podcast episode number one Keith Haring silence equals death firstly I would like to thank Nicole McLaughlin aka Nico Paws for speaking so passionately and openly about her personal experiences with this work and the impact that it's had on her and I hope you the listener have learned something I know I certainly did if you've enjoyed this podcast please make sure that you like, rate and subscribe. And while listening, if you perhaps have thought of someone that might be interested or would benefit from um, listening themselves, then please do feel free to pass it on. Finally, my name is Jo McLaughlin. I am your host and your resident art historian. And I look forward to welcoming you back on the podcast next week when we speak to the incredible Katie Wignall about an amazing brutalist estate in London called the Barbican. Tune in next week for more fun from the Joe's Art History Podcast. Until then, keep learning and remember, art is for all. <laughs>